most games with a popular following reach that milestone thanks to thoughtful, innovative design, enjoyable gameplay and the continued support committed to them by the developers. Other games got there through sheer dumb luck. This is a video that looks at one such game, Guns The Duel, developed by South Korean studio Mayet. The name is a play on the maxim, there is no I in team. Well, they disagreed and inserted it right in the middle and then flipped the word around, Mayet. So what was the game like? Guns is a third person shooter that is primarily a player versus player experience, though it does have a cooperative player versus environment mode called Quest. Let's discuss that briefly as it is very much a sideshow. This mode has players clear levels of NPCs in order to progress to the next stage. Light machine guns are the weapons of choice due to their unparalleled magazine capacity. They can kill a significantly greater number of NPCs before they run out of ammunition. Once the final stage is complete, players are rewarded with loot in the form of weapon, gear and consumable items like torn pages and skull dolls. These items can then be consumed in a quest lobby to increase the difficulty, add a boss or two to the final stage that drop more powerful gear. That wraps it up for co-op. Let's move on to a bit of history. The first release of Guns The Duel is unclear and sources disagree whether it was first launched in 2003 or 2004. Wikipedia states the game was first released in Korea in 2003, while Mayet listed the game's release to have been in 2004. Whatever the case, the game is around 16 years old at this point and it sure looks the part. Plain as it may be, this game went on to accrue a following much larger than one might expect at first glance. How did it do this? Perhaps a more useful question would be, what attracted so many people to it and what kept them playing for years? A series of glitches that elevated its gameplay far beyond anything its developers intended or could have ever predicted. Before we get into those, let us first look at the core gameplay the developers did design. Guns has a surprising emphasis on melee weapons, swords in particular. With that said, let's first look at what the game was named after, Guns. Firearms in Guns follow the standard convention. Press the left mouse button to fire and R to reload. Shooting is greatly simplified and perhaps hampered by the inability to aim down sight, which affects certain types of guns more than others. Automatic weapons like rifles and light machine guns might have benefited greatly if you could aim them precisely on your target. But shotguns and dual-wheeled pistols? Not so much. In fact, pump-action shotguns and dual-wielded revolvers were the preferred choice for enthusiasts, who looked down on anyone using automatic weapons, calling them sprayers. Ironically, sprayers would be at a disadvantage as equipping guns decrease maneuverability. Because of the game's high time to kill, the only viable automatic weapons were light machine guns because of their high magazine capacity. Sprayers' only hope was to keep their distance and hose their targets down before they got too close. Rifles and submachine guns would exhaust their supply within a couple of seconds and need to reload, giving the target plenty of time to close in and press the attack. The game also featured rocket launchers, a personal favourite of mine as their splash damage made hitting the target a tad easier. This was offset by the slow velocity of the rocket projectile, but it was still a very enjoyable weapon nonetheless. That brings us to movement, which at first glance can appear deceptively simple. Guns uses a standard WASD control scheme. Press W to walk forward, S to go back, A to step left and D to go right. Double tap any of these and you will roll if you have a gun equipped which can be done while shooting or reloading. On the other hand, if you have equipped a melee weapon like a sword for instance, double tapping WASD will have you dash in that direction instead. Dashes are used most often in conjunction with jumping, which is mapped to the standard spacebar. Jump dashing gets you further quicker than regular dashing since the delay between a jump and a dash is shorter than the delay between two consecutive dashes. Jump dashing can further be combined with attacking with swords to scale walls though this can also be done by just walking up to a wall and pressing jump. Walls could also be traversed by running across them, though a developer would later reveal that this was an unintended bug they incorporated into a sequel. More on that later. Moving on to melee weapons, we'll look at the most commonly used one, the sword. Pressing the right mouse button with the sword equipped would fling your target into the air, but deal no damage on its own. This was called flipping in some circles and launching in others will stick to calling a flipping to avoid any confusion with rocket launchers. If the flip target did nothing, they'd fall on their back and take some time to pick themselves up. But if they pressed jump while they were in the air, they would land on their feet. 
With swords and dual wielder saws called karachis, you could block incoming attacks by pressing shift. This is similar to all block in For Honor, except this would partially block incoming gunfire too, though it wasn't completely immune to shotgun fire. Players in block stance were still vulnerable to flips and splash damage from rocket launchers. Swords could be charged by holding the left mouse button. Once charged, your next attack will momentarily paralyze the opponent. This charged attack is called a massive. However, if you tried to hit a guarding enemy with a regular slash instead, you'd be the one staggered and the blocker's sword will be instantly charged for a free massive. To make it easier to understand, we'll call this parrying as it's similar to the parry mechanic in For Honor. If you use a dagger instead of swords, you cannot block incoming attacks though you can still incapacitate your enemies with a right click, which will knock them to the ground instantly. The dagger is seldom used compared to its alternatives, though a few did manage to develop a strategy around it called D-Style. Even so, players using these techniques are hard to come by, so we won't dwell on daggers further. No matter what melee weapon you equip, you'd always press left mouse button to attack. This was called slashing. You could chain up to four of these in succession, but you'd only want to do so in one very specific circumstance. With swords and karachis though, there was a catch, or rather, a glitch. When you attack an enemy with a sword or karachis, the damage isn't dealt at the end of the swing animation, but rather when your character starts the swing. You could cancel the animation early by pressing block and still deal the sword's full damage. There was little point to letting your character complete the swing animation, as doing so accomplished nothing but keep you stationary and vulnerable. Cancelling the swing early would allow you to move on to other manoeuvres in the time it would otherwise have taken your character to complete the animation. This glitch and the animation cancelling it enabled form the basis for an entire system of emergent gameplay called K-Style, or Korean Style, as it is believed to have originated in South Korea, the country the game was developed in and also the country it was first released in. To understand K-Style, let's look at the fundamental stepping stone that beginners would first have to master before anything else, the butterfly. This technique would have you jump, dash, slash and block in rapid succession, consolidating increased mobility, faster attacks and a window of defence in one fluid move. The best part was the ability to chain these together, as you could seamlessly transition from one butterfly to the next. There were more advanced variants of butterflies that incorporated more slashes before the dash. These were known as double butterfly and triple butterfly. Any beginner trying to spam slashes against a butterfly would find themselves parried, giving the K-Styler a free, massive and plenty of time to initiate an instant kill combo. More on instant kills in a moment. There were very few ways to counter a K-Styler without using K-Style yourself. That being said, there was one technique that frustrated K-Stylers to no end. Turtling. Holding guard in order to block and parry incoming slashes from the K-Styler's butterflies. So how did K-Stylers deal with turtles? Players holding guard were still vulnerable to flips, which could then flow into an instant kill combo. Speaking of which, what is an instant kill and what does it have to do with flips? Flips also applied their effect upon the start of their animation rather than at the end, meaning they could be skipped by tapping guard, allowing the flipper to quickly jump and slash the airborne target. This would cause the target to begin falling immediately upon getting hit, giving rise to the name Instant Fall. However, the flipper could delay the fall by slashing the target, causing them to remain suspended helplessly in mid-air while they were being attacked, allowing the flipper to slash them to death before they hit the ground. This was called an instant kill and was one of the most impressive techniques in the game to watch, if you weren't on the receiving end of it. If you were on the receiving end of it, it is similar to falling to Centurion's cutscene combo in For Honor. Death was even quicker if the flipper opted to use guns, as the target would remain frozen in mid-air while they were being shot, a process that was quickest and safest with shotguns. Speaking of shotguns, K-Style introduced several techniques centered around shotguns, primarily improving their rate of fire and mobility. Players using guns couldn't dash and were restricted to rolling, which took longer and committed the player to the direction of the tumble. If the player had instead equipped a sword, they could turn on a dime using back-to-back -back butterflies. In a nutshell, players were less manoeuvrable with a gun compared to a sword, a problem which K-Style rectified with a series of moves that all began with the use of a sword. The first three steps in all these manoeuvres were the same as a butterfly, jump, dash, slash. 
However, you wouldn't then let go of the attack button after you slashed, but instead switch to your gun, which would fire automatically if you hadn't lifted your finger off the left mouse button. This move allowed you to dash while using a ranged weapon and had the added benefit of hitting your target twice if you were in melee range, once with your sword and once again with your gun. This was often combined with techniques that increase the shotgun's rate of fire, so let's look at those now. All shotguns in the game were pump actions, the cycling of which was impractically slow for fast-paced combat. This would have been a problem for K-stylers who liked to run with shotguns in all two of their weapon slots. However, they discovered a bug that could be exploited to significantly improve shotgun's rate of fire. To do this, they fired the first shotgun, pressed reload and immediately swapped to the other shotgun. The reload cancelled the recycling animation of the first shotgun and decreased the delay between switching weapons, allowing the player to fire the second shotgun significantly quicker than intended. This technique was called reload shot and was integrated with the mobility manoeuvres explored earlier to eliminate the delay between firing the gun and switching to the sword. In simpler terms, reload cancelling allowed K-stylers to run circles around their target, slashing and shooting them all the while. All in all, K-style significantly raised the skill ceiling and the skill floor required to play the game at any competent level. Guns was hard to get into and even harder to master. It's no surprise that the community has dwindled to a small but dedicated few who have already sunk years into the game. With that said, a large factor in Guns' decline can be attributed to the mismanagement of its availability. Mayat initially tried distributing the game internationally, but this server fell into decline due to pervasive hacking and the lack of support from the developers. Mayat also tried licensing the game out to partners around the world, relying on third parties to expand availability to new regions. For example, IG Games received the rights to distribute and monetize guns in North America and Europe, launching on November 29, 2006. IG would later be bought by Aria Games in 2012, an acquisition that spelled doom for the game in 2013, just one year after the purchase. Level Up Games received the rights to distribute guns in Brazil and India in 2006, which they did for less than two years. By 2014, all but one of the official servers had been shut down. The sole survivor was Guns Ultra, which exclusively served Latin America. Everybody else had to make do with private servers that heavily altered the experience from the original. In 2016, Korean fans caught a break when Massingsoft, a company that acquired the rights to guns, announced they will be relaunching the game after a successful closed beta. They were lucky. There is still no official server for the English-speaking guns community. How did it get to this point? Why did the majority of companies that acquired the licenses to distribute guns decide to stop doing so? The obvious answer would be it was unprofitable, which is ironic considering many quite rightly perceived the game as pay to win. What led them to believe this? Elemental and Chance could not be unlocked on official servers and instead had to be bought with real money. These enchanted the sword to apply a debuff if the target was struck with a massive, inflicting additional damage over time, or even paralyzing the target beyond the usual massive stun. What made this a particularly bitter pill to swallow was the game's tedious progression system. It would take months to level a character up to enable the use of the game's most powerful weapons and this put beginners at yet another disadvantage. Not only were they outmatched in terms of skill acquired through practice, they also took more damage than they dished out if they could even manage to land a hit on an experienced opponent. It is no wonder then that players tried to shorten the grind any way they could, devising techniques that perhaps weren't exactly normal, organic gameplay. The simplest of these would involve two players creating a private room where they would kill each other for experience and bounty, the in-game currency used to buy weapons and armor. This was called swapping and was frowned upon by administrators who would issue bans to anyone they caught doing it. I never agreed with this. I was of the opinion what two people did in the privacy of their own room was their own business. But the powers that be thought differently. Nevertheless, players weren't deterred and even developed a hack to automate the process. As far as hacks go, this was one of the benign ones. The more malicious hacks were, if nothing else, a sight to behold if only for the uniqueness of their effects. These weren't the typical wall hacks and aimbots. Instead, hacks for guns granted a variety of game-breaking bonuses like God Mode, otherwise known as Immortality, while others greatly increased walking speed and allowed the hacker to clip through walls and even leave the map's borders entirely. The most egregious hacks would perform a thousand attacks every second with the equipped weapon, melee or ranged. With the sword in hand, hackers had two cheats to choose from. One that would slash all enemies in range a million times a second. This was called a lawnmower. 
The other would spam massives around the user, making the hacker extremely easy to spot from across the map. The range counterpart of these cheats was most annoying on rocket launchers and shotguns, the former unleashing a devastating rocket barrage, and the latter mowing targets down like a minigun. It's easy to see why so many blame rampant hacking as a principal cause of the game's decline. However, I would argue that the developers were also complicit in their downfall, with their disgraceful negligence of their service. May it consistently fail to implement a functional anti-cheat, all the way leading up to the closure of the international server. Was it apathy or incompetence? Hanlon's razor dictates, never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. Looking at the game's awful netcode makes us suspect Mayat's ineptitude might have also been a factor. Guns use peer-to-peer -peer networking which cause horrendous latency issues, the worst of which caused lagging players to appear stuck in mid-air, though they were invulnerable in their moment of paralysis. Even if this didn't happen, hits would often fail to register, though the game client still misled players with audio cues that ordinarily confirmed a hit. As demoralizing as these problems were, fans were still willing to give Mayat a second chance when the developer revealed they were working on the game's sequel. Unfortunately, Guns 2, the second duel, would be yet another testament to Mayat's incompetence. In 2008, Mayat announced that Guns 2 had been in development since October of 2007. They also revealed they wouldn't like to keep K-Style the same as the first Guns, going on to say they would improve it with their own style. One year later, they announced Guns 2's release schedule had been changed to 2010 because they were planning to show new materials. After languishing in development hell for years, Guns 2 was registered on Steam Greenlight in March 2013. In November, Mayat released an interview that crushed all hope fans might have held onto. Hello everybody, I'm lead game designer Hyo sok -yun. We are very pleased with all the community feedback we've been receiving. Today, I would like to pick up one question we've probably heard most often. Many are asking if K-Style will be back in Guns 2. K-Style is essentially a way to quickly cancel certain movements and then link them together with different actions. In the original game, this was a bug, but it quickly turned out to enhance the gameplay. K-Style became the unique feature of Guns the Duel, offering intensive gameplay if you manage to master the control scheme. While these controls turned out to be an interesting feature, it really requires to twist and twirl your fingers around the keyboard. This also opens up a wide gap between new players and those who had already played the game for a while. That's why already in the planning phase for Guns 2, we decided to take a different approach. Some iconic K-style moves such as wall running will still be found in the game, but they are now part of the actual controls. I was surprised May had considered wall running K-style. I thought wall running was a basic move they consciously built into the game. This just goes to show how lackluster and bare bones their design was. We want to broaden our audience without taking any depth out of the game. Looks like you failed at both. Not only did you fail to broaden your audience, you also disappointed the only community that was certain to give you a chance. All your loyal fans wanted was a remaster of guns with better netcode and a functioning anti-cheat, but you decided to fix what wasn't broken. You removed the one reason anyone was looking forward to your game. Enthusiasts tried once more to make Mayat see the light. What did the CEO have to say to them? Like we have mentioned a few times already, there is nothing to reconsider about K-Style. We do not intend to reproduce it just like that of Guns 1. How did that work out for you? Guns 2 eventually launched as an early access beta in February 2014 with a peak of 10,441 players in its first week. Just one month later, they were down to 2,000 players. July 2014 will be the last month the game saw over 1,000 players. 12 months after this, Mayat announced that they have ceased operation. Guns 2 hasn't fared much better. Looking at its play account, it's at death's door. After giving it a try, the game's failure makes sense. The sequel feels incredibly slow and clunky coming from the fast, fluid movement of the first guns. Even a move as simple as the butterfly is damn near impossible because of the delay between the block of one butterfly and the jump of the next. This is why we adjusted K-Style in a way that acrobatic moves are now part of the actual game controls. Mayat didn't improve K-Style, they neutered it. What have they to show for it? A dead company and a dying game. We believe this catastrophe would not have occurred had Mayat just listened to the only community that was likely to commit to their game. They were handed a formula for success on a silver platter and they threw it away. Despite the arrogance and stupidity of the developers, 
it's always tragic when a game is left to die. Especially one with so much potential that it already has a following who are still waiting for companies to capitalize on said potential. Gun serves as a wake-up call for developers and publishers. If you stumble upon success, build on it. Don't throw it away just because you think you can do better. More importantly, listen to what your fans are telling you and never dismiss their feedback. This should be obvious by now given how many games have suffered because of this. Guns is also an opportunity as a game still has a large following, just waiting for a reliable way to play the game without having their experience ruined by latency and hackers. This community is a goldmine waiting to be explored. All they want is a reskin of the game with updated visual fidelity and anti-cheat and netcode that are actually functional. Come on publishers, what are you waiting for? If you enjoyed Guns, please share this video to spread awareness of its potential. If you never played Guns and still made it this far into the video, share it anyway as this is an experience you shouldn't miss out on. The game had all the makings of an eSport and if somebody gives it the support it deserves, it still can be. That concludes our analysis of Guns, The Duel. There is more content like this on the way, so please like, subscribe and press the bell button so you don't miss out. While you're here, feel free to watch our playlist on Denuvo's history and performance impact and our hardware analysis of CPUs and GPUs. Do you play Rainbow Six Siege or Dota 2? Check out the other channel for analytical guides for both games. Link is in the description and on the screen. This will also serve as our secondary channel, so please subscribe even if you don't play these games.